This week we start a week, uh, a new series uh, about the Psalms of Ascent. Which we're, it's called Happy Trails, and it's a, so we're going to be a little different in this series. Um, we're gonna actually going to be, uh, it's a video series, so we're going to be watching Pastor Levi uh, talking about the Psalms of Ascent. And we're going to see some pictures, some, some beautiful country. Um, not that our country is not beautiful, just different kind of beauty. Um, but the Psalms of Ascent. So we encourage you to, to lean in, to engage, to grow, and, and to just connect with these Psalms and the way they co- connect us and point us back to God and give our worship over to Him. All right? So it's a little bit different, but we're really excited to hear about the Psalms this morning. So without further uh, ado, as it were, um, here's the Psalms called Happy Trails. Welcome to the beginning of the Happy Trails series. For the next four weeks, we're going to be exploring some of the beautiful places where we have Fresh Life Church in Montana, in Oregon, in Utah, and where I'm currently at right now in Wyoming. I'm sitting at the top of Teton Pass in Wilson, Wyoming, overlooking the beautiful Jackson Hole, about to head out on a hike, and I'm so excited that you're going to come with me. If you have your Bible, grab it. You're going to want to make your way to Psalm 121 as we begin our first journey in this adventure that is the Happy Trail series. top of uh, the beginning of a hike really called Mount Glory, which will be the tip of, uh, of this climb. If we make it to the top, then we'll have uh, successfully uh, climbed Mount Glory, which seems pretty appropriate to be going up a mount called Mount Glory. Uh, I, I feel like that's good in every sense of the word. But if you have your Bible, Psalm 121 is where we're going to be uh, this week. We'll jump into that in just a minute. But let me just sort of explain what we're jumping into in this series, Happy Trails. We're going to be bringing these messages to hiking trails across this beautiful part of the country where we live and have church and get to worship God, and it's amazing. And it's appropriate we're doing so because we're going to be studying uh, for the next few weeks here at the church the Psalms of Ascent. And this is uh, a section of scripture that begins in Psalm 120 and goes all the way through Psalm 134. Now, just backing up, the book of Psalms is a a book full of songs. It's literally all sorts of different types of songs that are lumped together that are expressions of praise and worship uh, that are really fitting for different occasions and different situations and seasons of the soul. Just like a golfer wouldn't pull the driver out when he's on the green trying to putt or to get out of the, the sand trap, you, you wouldn't necessarily uh, want to you know, chip it. I mean, you, you do, I'm, I'm at the end of my golfing analogies here, but you have different tools in the golf bag for different occasions. And so it is when it comes to the book of Psalms. There are different types, different categories, different sorts of, of praise that we use for different occasions, different situations to express different emotions and to connect to God in the midst of different circumstances. You know, as you're celebrating something or declaring dependence or uh, a psalm that would really come around the idea of repentance or even just to express anger and frustration bewilderment uh, or even disgust over what you're experiencing in life and and to bring that to God. And I think it's amazing that as we open up the book of Psalms, we find room to put in, just like in a pack, you would have different, you know, places to put your water bottle or to put, you know, your, your trekking poles. So in worship, we can bring to God whatever it is, and He has a compartment for us to put that in and just to cast all our cares upon Him. Included in the book of Psalms is this section, Psalm 120 through 134, and it's 15 different Psalms that are called the Songs of Ascent, or they've been called the Songs of the Road or Pilgrim Songs, 
the Psalms of Travelers. And the reason we've chosen to bring these songs to study them on a hiking trail is because that's literally the context that they were intended for and where they were primarily used when they were first uh, given and first uh, written. We know David wrote four of them. Solomon, his son, wrote one of them. And then there are 10 that, that we don't know. Some people say maybe King Hezekiah wrote them. We don't know. But in these 15 songs, we have uh, basically what would be used like we would use a road trip playlist. You know, no one would get in the car and head out across the country without giving some thought. No one, I mean, that's to be trusted anyhow. Uh, without giving some thought to the jams for the road, you have playlists that you're gonna create and curate carefully for an expedition. And that's sort of what we find in this section of scripture. We have the playlist that pilgrims would use when making their way to the holy city of Jerusalem for feasts where they would worship the God of the Bible. Now, in the history of, of the world, you have this amazing individual, Abraham, who's this exceptional individual who God gives promises to. And connected to all of these promises was this idea of bringing a savior into the world. Now, Abraham, this father of faith, as he's called, because he believed God who made crazy promises, he eventually had a family, even though the whole circumstances under which that took place was improbable and impossible. And then all of a sudden it happened. And now you have Isaac, his son, and eventually you have a whole nation that we know of today as the nation of the Jews or, or Israel. And they had at the center of their worship this city called Jerusalem. It was where there was a temple. It was where the Ark of the Covenant at one point was housed. And it was where sacrifices would be brought to worship God, really going back all the way to the Garden of Eden when animals' blood had to be shed as a payment for the sins, and it all pointed forward to Jesus. Anyhow, through the course of the religious calendar, all of the rituals and all of that, the feasts that were on their schedule, included three where they had to travel to the, na to the city of Jerusalem, across the nation to the city, Jerusalem, or from wherever they lived. And they would walk there, of course. And as they would do so, to keep their hearts sort of matched up to what was happening, as they would be ascending to get to Jerusalem, because no matter where you came from, you had to go uphill to get to the city because it was built up on a plateau surrounded by mountains. If you go to Israel today, you can see what I'm talking about. But no matter what area you came from, where you lived, you had to go up to Jerusalem. So for Passover, for Pentecost, and the, for the Feast of Tabernacles, all these rituals, all these, you know, holy days that pointed forward to Jesus, people would be literally streaming in and traveling and spending time on the road. While they were walking, while they were hiking, while they were on these trails, they kept their hearts happy or they kept their hearts focused on what, what God wanted them to be thinking about by singing these songs to each other these 15 songs. And so we could really say as we're headed to heaven, and that's what Jesus promises for all of us, that we're headed to heaven, but on the way we're being formed for heaven and God's kingdom is being revealed in our hearts and in our lives as we live with our eyes and our hearts focused on, on God. These songs have intense meaning for us as well. We're gonna start this week with Psalm 121, which says, and we have it up on the screen for you, a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can consider this even as we take to the trails. We thank you that on this journey of life, as we come and as we go, you have a plan for each of us. I thank you for every single person at every single Fresh Life location, those watching church online or on the archive in the way that even now as we make our way as pilgrims through this world, trying to keep our hearts on heaven and being expressions of heaven to the people around us, we pray that we would keep our heart and mind centered by worship. We ask this in Jesus' name.
This first psalm that we're going to consider, Psalm 121, has eight verses, and it's broken up into four sections. An introduction, and then basically three things that follow. And in the beginning of it, the author starts by making this statement about lifting his eyes up to the hills. I lift my eyes up to the hills, but then he asks the question, from whence comes my help, or where does my help come from? And then eventually he answers his question with where he chooses to look when he needs help. But we have to just first acknowledge the, the reality that so many times we get into situations where we need help, where we, we lift our eyes up and we're just almost like in desperation because we're going through something that's hard, we're going through something that's, that's painful. And what's so great about that is that we find within this psalm the perfect recipe or, or the perfect answer or strategy for what to do when life hurts the most. John Phillips wrote in his commentary on the Psalms about this particular song, that it's a song to turn to when shadows deepen and the future looks bleak. So how does that hit you right now? Do you feel like there's any situation in your life that almost has deepening shadows? Maybe it's a medical situation or something you're going through with someone in your family, a, a marriage that is on the rocks that you're praying for, or maybe a son or daughter who you've become estranged from somehow, or something at work, or something you're going through. When the shadows deepen, and when the future looks bleak. I think all of us at, can relate to that on some level or another, and if we don't currently, at some point we will. We're just gonna face something, we're looking off, we're just almost like, we're left going, where does my help come from? What do, I, what do I do now? Where do I go? And as these pilgrims would make their way to Jerusalem, they literally would lift their eyes up and see hills. You, you couldn't go to Jerusalem without seeing hills. And they had different sorts of associations. You know, they knew that lions and, and bears lived in, in, the, in the mountains, in the hills. But there was also a very real danger. Traveling with your family on foot you were open to threat. They would sleep, they would camp out kind of on the trail in situations kind of like what you're seeing around me here in Wyoming, just the Middle Eastern version. We know when Jesus told that story about the Good Samaritan, it was all rotating around a man who fell among thieves on his way, kind of in the same exact area where they were traveling to and from Jerusalem. Now, he was headed, you know, on the, on the road to Jericho and he fell among thieves. So there was that too. I mean, if you were a criminal, if you were, you know, looking to prey on, on, on victims, uh, you'd have very real tangible opportunities, soft targets as families would travel. They'd have to have money with them. They'd have to have foods with them. They'd have to have what they would need to survive. So, you know, if you're bringing your family out, you're exposing yourself to risk, I guess, to head to Jerusalem out of faithfulness and obedience to God. And if you're, you know, in a, in a spot that you're worried, there would be this prayer that would kind of resonate. I lift my eyes up. Where's, how am I going to get through this? Or, or the situation waiting for me back at home. How am I going to get through this? And then he said, I lift my eyes to the hills. Now, in that, we find almost like, oh, I'm going to find just inspiration. If I lift my eyes to the hills, I'm going to find, wow, God's so good. No, that, that's not exactly what he meant because context is everything. First of all, um, there was the fact that in that day, all the false gods that were worshipped throughout Israel's history, all of the idols, all the shrines, they would almost always be in high places. And so in Jerusalem, you have this, this plateau where a temple was built to worship the God who created the world, who spoke to Abraham, who established the nation of Israel, all to fulfill his promise he made to Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden to eventually send forth his son to die on the cross as a substitute because we couldn't keep the law ourselves, make ourselves righteous. So Jesus was going to do it for us by taking our sin upon him and then eventually rising from the dead. So it is, there is established in the midst of all these mountains that were full of shrines, full of gods that were worshipped uh, in sexual perverse acts and all sorts of different ways. You had literally, as he says this, he's saying, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where's my help going to come from? He's thinking through the options. Am I going to look to an idol for help? Am I going to look to this false god to get me through this? Now we have to bring that to, to our personal you know, frame of reference. When you're feeling low, when you're feeling agitated, when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling unappreciated, what's your go-to false god that you look to? Now, you're, you might be hearing that going, what are you talking about, Levi? I don't have a false god I look to. Oh, of course we do. A false god is just anything we look to 
to give us what God has said he alone is capable of delivering on. I know for me, the temptation can be to look to social media for a quick hit of happiness or to an online purchase or, or maybe for you it's Adderall or, or Xanax when you're feeling stressed, when you just can't handle it. Is it, you know, four glasses of wine to sort of dull and make fuzzy the things that you're frightened by? The truth is all of us can end up making the mistake of looking to the hills, looking to a false god to help us through something that's causing the shadows to deepen and the future to look bleak. But then what's so great after he says, I'm not going to choose to stare at a false god to help me, and I'm also not going to stare at the thing that I'm scared of. Remember, these are hills that are potentially full of criminals and definitely full of wild animals and danger. He doesn't, he, he doesn't end there. I'm lifting my eyes to the hills. He then says, no, I choose to look to the Lord who makes heaven and earth, who made heaven and earth. That's where my health comes from. Okay, check this out. This is so cool. He doesn't just look to the hills. He looks above the hills. He doesn't look to the mountains and stop there. Yeah, he sees it, but he looks above the mountains. He's not choosing to look just at a mountain. He's choosing to keep his eyes focused on the one who made the mountain. And that's really the choice we all have in this life. Are we going to look to the hills or to the one who made the hills? This is the Goliath principle. Saul was so scared of Goliath because he lived his life focused on how tall he was and how he was taller than everybody. That was King Saul. But when Goliath came, who was taller than him, he had no answer for that because now he was being threatened by something taller than he was. But David didn't look at Goliath and see someone taller than his power because his power didn't come from how tall he was. His power came from how tall his God was. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you look to the hills, you're either going to look to a false God who can't help you or you're going to look to something that's going to scare you. But if you choose to look higher than the hills, above the hills, you look to the one who's bigger than the thing that's bigger than you. you. You see what I'm saying? What you're up against in this life is bigger than you are. I get that. I know cancer is very real and divorce is very hard and, and grief is very savage and, and merciless. Those things are big. And if you look at them, you're going to have to resort to a false god to help you just to cope. It won't give you true lasting peace, but it can give you at times just a distraction for a little bit of time. But if you choose to look above the hills, you look to the one who's bigger than the thing that's bigger than you. And that's how David had such a great peace heading towards Goliath. And that's how the author of Psalm 121 makes it through this. I don't just choose to look to the hills. I look for help to the one who made the heaven and the earth, who made the mountain that seems so intimidating to me. And when you live that way, listen to me, it unleashes three things into your life that we're going to uncover in the next three couplets. The first is this. You find that in God, you have a sure-footed guide, a sure-footed guide. Write that down. David talked about how God, once he's what I'm focusing on, is going to keep me from falling on this path. The, the path that I'm on, even as I'm talking to you, I don't know if you can keep seeing me shifting my weight, my left foot keeps going to sleep because this path is steep and it's covered in pebbles and rocks and my feet want to slip. But what's cool about it is the shoes that I'm wearing have traction. I mean, hiking boots these days, a lot of times the tread actually gets made by like companies that make tires, like Michelin. They make tread for hiking boots and you have all these different things that basically give you traction on the trail and keep you sure-footed. That's what David says happens. Once your eyes are on God, he will not allow your foot to be moved. And then he said this, look at this. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will not slumber nor sleep. Here's what's so cool about having a sure-footed guide keeping your, your feet into a place of traction. Because he never sleeps, you can. You, you, you catch what I'm saying? God doesn't slumber. God doesn't sleep. God doesn't clock out. God doesn't ever turn his phone off. So that means that you can. I think all of us are tempted to feel like we have to keep the, everything juggling, the business, all this stuff. And, and so as a result, we, we sleep with our phones on our nightstand and we never have a moment where we're unreachable and we never get that breathing in, breathing out, being on a trail, just being 
quiet and still and knowing that God is Lord because at times we're so frantically trying to keep up, to fake it till we make it, to project this epic image. Look how great my kids are. Look how beautiful my home is. Look how white my teeth are. And we're trying to like keep this like, like image up and, and, and but just the ability to rest and go, hold on a second. The one who keeps my feet on this trail, he never goes to sleep. So I can. I don't have to strive. I don't have to try and put up a front. I don't have to try and solve all these battle, battles myself. I can just trust God, walk with Him, breathe deeply, enjoy life, and trust Him. It's an amazing thing to have a sure-footed guide. The second thing that we find that comes as a result of looking above the hills to the one who made the heavens and the earth is that we get shelter for every season. A shelter for every season. Not only is he a sure-footed guide who keeps our foot from slipping as we go to new places, as we're continually going up and continually going into God's plans for our lives, but we also have a shelter for every season. And the truth is, it's a real blessing right now to be in the shade of this tree, out of the frame over here, beautiful rocks, and kind of where I'm at right now, I have a little bit of a shelter to rest. And, you know, part of being out on the trail is that at times you're exposed for long stretches and the sun can kind of beat down on you. And that's why it's so important that you have water with you and that you, you know, have sun protection and sunscreen and, you know, normally you'd wear a hat if you weren't, you know, like, if you didn't like do your hair today, you know, it takes a lot of work to look this good. Uh, but the truth is having shelter to take a break for a bit is, is amazing. And uh, back on the trail as they would head towards Jerusalem and sing this song, Psalm 121, they could definitely relate to the, the beautiful presence of resting uh, under some shelter uh, because you get dehydrated quickly and you can, you can run down pretty fast. And we find that exact idea here in where it says in, in verse 5 that the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your, look at this, shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. So we have here both sides of the spectrum. And, and some of us are in seasons right now where it just feels like night. And, and others of us are in seasons where the sun's shining and it's, it's bright and it's beautiful and, and uh, it's daytime. But, but the truth is in every season, we have a shelter, a shelter from the sun that's going to dehydrate you and, and get you overheated, but also a shelter when it's night and it can get quickly cold. You know, when you're up in the mountains, it can go from being super hot, then all of a sudden, man, you're, you're freezing. And so whether it's the sun beating down on you or the, the cold of the moon, the cold of night, we have in the one who made the heaven and the earth, we have this beautiful concept of, of shelter. You know, it's funny, the, the moon, you think about how in a previous day, there used to be this belief that the, the moon could actually make you sick, that you could actually, if you had too much exposure to the moon's light, to the moonbeams, that you could actually kind of develop insanity. And that's where the word lunatic actually comes from. You know, we think of lunar movements or the lunar cycles and, and the effect they thought the moon would have on you was that it could cause you crazy. And so we know that's probably not true, although the moon does have an impact. I remember the nurses when one of our children was born telling us that there's more babies that come in when there's a full moon uh, than, than on other nights and uh, obviously can have a different effect on, on different things. We know that there's, there's cycles to a woman's body and the impact of, of the, I'm not sure if the moon has an impact on that, but what, what I do know is that this verse is saying that there's grace for every season. And I actually want to just speak to the husbands for a moment that we actually can really be a benefit and a blessing to the, to the women in our lives, to our, our wives or to anyone we're around if we're giving extra grace when we know that there's cycles going on. And in our family, we've had to kind of figure out rhythms and, and how to give extra grace and how to receive extra grace. I know my wife, if she was giving this message, she would say she's had to learn in different times when there's a, a cycle or a season to, to life happening on a monthly basis that she has to sort of 
prepare herself extra ahead of time to know when there's surging emotions and different feelings and it uh, it's almost like your mind can play tricks on you she's told me and and really having to like choose grace and choose to put what God says above how she feels and I don't have to have a, a monthly cycle to know that's something that we all need to do to be able to choose God's word and choose to believe we have a shelter for us we don't have to sit out there on the exposed you know terrain of the vicious viciousness of just doing what we feel when we can find that shelter find that shade we're protected from the wind we can have protection from from rain and we can have a shelter for the different things that we face in this life whether that's the heat of day or the the, the moon that hits us by night but it's not just shelter I love this look at it, the verse one more time it says God is your shade look at it at your right hand now no hating on any of my southpaw friends all the love for y'all uh, but in the bible the right hand was a position of power the right hand was a position of strength and it kind of symbolized authority so when the bible says god's your shade at your right hand it's saying that he shelter for you even in areas where you think you've got it and i think all of us can relate to kind of feeling like we can muscle up we can kind of pull ourselves up by the bootstraps we don't need help from anybody else but not only does the devil attack you where you're weak, he does that. The devil also attacks you where you're strong. When you look at some of the classic stories in scripture, you, you think about how God has, you know, had to help people to realize even their strengths can be areas of vulnerability. You think about Moses. The Bible says he's the meekest man who ever lived, and yet he was tempted in areas of explosive anger where any, he was anything but meek as he was like raging. Or you think about David, a man of great passion. It was his passion that was his strength, but it also was his passion that was his undoing. Abraham, hello, the father of faith, who had lapses in faith and gave in to his doubts. Or Elijah, probably the most courageous person you could find. And yet, what did he give in to? Incredible bouts of fear and, uh, and, 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 and showing anything but courage. So we not only need to trust God for shelter and shade and protection in areas of weakness, we also need to trust him in areas where we're strong. And we need his help even when we're feeling good because that can be a time when we're susceptible and open up to attack. What a great idea and what a great thought that God is a shelter. He's providing shelter for you for every season. I'm gonna rest up for a bit. Ten minutes later, he successfully gets his Bible in his backpack. <laughs> well, we've made it to the top of Mount Glory. We started at 8,400 feet, and now we're up 10,086 feet above sea level over the course of one mile, gaining 1,600 feet of elevation, and my lungs and my legs are telling the story about it. But the reward, of course, is the view from the top. Commanding views of Jackson Hole and the Snake River and the Gross Venture Range, and this is the the glory bowl. Apparently people love to come up here skinning up on their skis and then crushing it down in the winter time. And we've also reached the end of our first Psalm, the first of four that we're going to be teaching through during the Happy Trail series, Psalm 121, where in these final verses, we have this idea that God's going to preserve us from all evil. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. And so our final of three takeaway truths that are unleashed in our lives when we choose to not just look at the mountains, not look at what we're afraid of, not even try to look to something on the mountains, a false God to try and help us, but we lift our eyes higher than the mountains to the ones who made the heavens and the earth. The third thing that's unleashed in our lives after our sure-footed guide and the shelter that we have for every season is the fact that we have a guardian for our soul. He shall preserve your soul. There's a lot of things in our lives that need to be kept, need to be monitored, monitored need to be t taken care of. You know, we have to, you know, preserve our health. We have to conserve our energy. We have to watch out for our time. But the single most important thing 
for you to take care of and for you to, to watch out for is your soul. And if your soul's not well, it doesn't matter what is going well in your life. If, even if you have money in the bank, even if you have lots of friends, even if you have a great job, if your soul's not well, it'll just affect you in, in every way. And that's why God is so concerned about your soul, that, that He wants to preserve your soul from evil. God is interested in who you are on the inside, in your character, in your spirit, in the parts of you that don't show up when you take a selfie. He cares about what the Bible describes as your inner man. And that's why he's constantly moving you towards your better self, to, towards who he made you to be, towards who Jesus paid for you to become when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, giving you resurrection power. That's why it's so important to daily spend time with him. You know, we're always consuming media, consuming through friends we hang out with. But when we turn to God, we allow him to nourish our soul, worship, prayer, coming together with your church family to, to lift up the name of Jesus, being in a small group, serving in your community, choosing the solitude of a beautiful mountain hike over, you know, binge watching another TV show on Netflix or, or purchasing something. is serving instead of consuming. These sorts of things really nourish your soul on the inside. And while sometimes it can feel like there's so many demands on our schedule, so many things pushing and pulling for our time and for the limited resources in our lives, it can feel sometimes like we're being selfish if we take time for ourselves. You know, to, to say, hey, I'm going to take a few hours and just go be alone. I'm going to take some of the best part of the early part of the day and be alone with God before I rush into work or go to a meeting or whatever. It can feel like it's selfish to take me time and go to the spa and get a pedicure. But let me just tell you something. The most selfless thing you can do is to take care of your soul. That's so important. I'm going to say it again. The most selfless thing you can do is to take care of your soul. So think back to this past week. How much time have you given for your soul to thrive? How much time have you given to being alone with God? If we all added up our Instagram minutes or added up our Amazon Prime or our YouTube clicks, I, I get it. We'd be up there. But what if we think, just think through honestly in the last week or so, how much time have we spent with God? Now, that's not to condemn you. It's to inspire you in this next week that's still to come with decisions that haven't been made. To seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, Levi, why do you say it's a selfless thing? If I'm taking care of my soul, that's, that's, that's being self-centered. Well, actually, on the contrary, once you take care of your soul, you're actually able to take care of other people and to help them. And the best thing you can do to change the world is to improve yourself. And there's nothing you can do that will better improve you than spending time with God. I don't know if you noticed it, but we've had a shift in this psalm that we've been reading on this happy trail. At the beginning of the psalm, it was, I lifted my eyes up to the hills. Whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. That's first person singular. But from verse 3 on to the end, it's all you. You, you, you. It's now this psalmist talking to other people, encouraging other people. He will not let your foot be moved. He will not let you uh, trip on the trail. He's your keeper, your shade. He will not let the sun strike you. He'll preserve, preserve your soul. What happened? Here's what happened. The psalmist spent some time making sure his soul thrived. And once that happened, he had something to give to other people. You see, you can't pour water out of an empty cup. And that's why it's actually a selfless act to get alone with God and to take care of ourselves so we actually have something to give to the world. If you want to help your family, if you want to help your friends, if you want to help people in this world who don't know God or people who are hurting, you have to receive from God so you have something to give to other people on behalf of God. And that's what we find here in this precious promise. It's the same idea on an airline when they tell you to put your mask on before you put the mask of someone else. You're like, no, I would never do that. Well, if you pass out, you can't help your kids. If you don't have oxygen flowing through your lungs, you're not there to help other people who are in danger. So take care of your soul. You can't take people where you haven't been yourself. You can't lead anyone else on trails that you haven't walked down already. Now I want to end here where the verse ends. The Lord preserves you, verse 8. Look at it on the screen. He'll preserve your going out, and you're coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. I know I normally give the messages title at the beginning of the sermon, but I saved it for the end for this reason. He ends with this idea of no matter where you go, no matter where life takes you, 
this God who wants to give you shade, who wants to make sure your feet don't slip, this God who wants to guard and preserve your soul, he's got you, he's got this, he's looking out for you, he's a bodyguard for you, wherever you go, always watching out for you, moving you towards your best interests. The promise is, no matter where you go, he can take care of it. So here's my sermon title for this message, Psalm 121. You could jot this down. Entrances, exits, and everywhere in between. Because that's where God can take care of you. Entrances, you're coming in. Exits, you're going out. And anywhere in between. That about covers the gamut of this life. I like how the message translation puts that verse. It says, he guards you when you leave. He guards you when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. And if that doesn't just choke you up to think of the fact that there's nowhere you can go. 10,000 feet up, down in a valley low, riding high in the penthouse, feeling like life's throwing you out on the street. It doesn't matter where you go, coming in, going out at the top, got a lot of followers, don't have any money, lots of connection, feel like you're a VIP, feel like no one knows your name, going out, coming in. He's got you. He loves you. His eye is on you. And he has plans for your life. Entrances, exits, and everywhere in between.